Well, hey everyone, welcome to LifePoint Online. My name is Rusty, I'm one of the pastors here. Thankful that you're joining us this weekend uh, as we go through a brand new sermon series actually called You Asked For It. Uh, We're basically, here's what we're doing. We're taking the questions that you're throwing out at us and we're gonna take 20, 30 minutes to answer those. Isn't that nice of us? I I thought it was. And so that's why we're doing it. And so I'm excited about the series uh, where a bunch of you have thrown a, a number of questions out. Thanks so much for doing that. Continue doing that, please. Uh, but, but here's this, the topic that we're going to tackle today. There's a lot of uh, questions around, uh, really the Bible, like, like someone said, Hey, Rusty, you know, on, on Easter, you talked about how the Bible was, was, uh, true and, 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 and authentic and real and all of that. Well, how am I supposed to know that? Like, how am I supposed to believe that? Right. Where it's almost like, Hey, you know what? I get Bible boy that you, that you believe that. Uh, but honestly, right, why, why should I? And see, that, that's, that's a really big question, isn't it? I mean, especially for a culture uh, that really no longer views the Bible uh, as an authority on truth. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time this week and just tackle that, that topic. But, but also from kind of just a practical standpoint, um, here's the reality for me. Uh, and that's, hey, you know what? The people who actually... Uh, apply what scripture says, what scripture really says, uh, are typically full of wisdom, grace, and truth. Uh, and that's just someone I want to be like, right? I mean, that's just the type of person that I want, I want to be. And so let me just ask, as you're sitting there in your homes, and again, thanks so much for, for joining us today, but let me just ask, how many of you grew up, uh, knowing the Bible song, right? The B-I-B-L-E, now that's the book for me, right? How many, how many of you grew up doing that? I did, I did. But see, I also know this is life point. And so there's probably a number of you that did not, uh, where maybe you probably grew up with other songs, right? Like 99 bottles of root beer on the wall or whatever, right? Whatever version it is that, that you uh, grew up on. But see, because of that, uh, I, I wanted to take it from this way, vantage point, because here's the reality. I think a lot of us come at this whole topic from different perspectives, right? From, from a different viewpoint where, where some of you uh, are probably saying, you know what, Rusty, I don't know if I even believe in the Bible. And see, my desire today, my desire today is not that you'd agree with me on everything, right? You're welcome to be wrong on a host of issues, just to be honest. Uh, but my desire today is to simply ask if you'll consider my key, my key assertion. And it's actually your first fill in there in your, in your outline. If you had a chance to print those out or you can click on the right on your computer and, and open in the notes section up. Uh, but my key assertion is this, write this down. Is your, your truth is really only as good as your source of truth. Where, where because of time, he, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not going to be looking at other religious books today. We just don't have the time for that. Uh, but what I want to do is I just want to look at how, how the Bible might be unique amongst them. And so to start us off, I thought I'd just, just start us off with a true-false quiz, all right? And so here's a true-false quiz. You say if it's true or false, uh, it'll, it'll be on the screen as well. But here's the first one. Lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. How many say true? Do you say false? Well, the answer is that's actually a myth. It's, it's false. Where lightning absolutely strikes twice in the same place. And, and in fact, uh, given, given us uh, an extended amount of time, it's probably inevitable as well. Or here's the second one, number two. Uh, Betty White is actually older than sliced bread. <laughs> Some of you youngsters out there are probably like, who's, who's Betty White? Uh, look it up, Golden Girls. Try to find it on Netflix. It'll change your life. Ruth is uh, <laughs> awesome. But, but here's the answer. Uh, the answer is true, actually. Uh, Betty was born in 1922. Sliced bread machine wasn't fully functional until 19, 1928. Here's number three. Number three is you can't hum while you hold your nose? The answer is true. Uh, some of you are still trying, but, but the answer is still true. And then here's the last one. Napoleon was short. True or false? The answer is false. Uh, historians have, has, have always stated that he was probably about five foot two, but more recently they figured out that he was actually about five foot seven, which made him taller than most of the men uh, during his time. And so honestly, that just gives me uh, makes me feel better about my own height. But anyway, I, I say that uh, because of this, right? Because here's the reality, is that sometimes I think we can gravitate uh, to what we've heard or what we've always known, right? Uh, we've just always known that, so we gravitate to that. 
And so I want to make sure that we've heard correctly when it comes to Scripture. Or again, for if, if you're maybe one of the skeptical people out there, here's, here's my premise for the skeptical, is that accepting the Bible is really more of a step of faith uh, and not a leap of faith. I don't know if I've told you this before, but there was a point where I was, I was sitting at a coffee shop one time, and this gal came up to me, and, and she stopped, and, and she said, you know, what is a, what is a, a smart, intelligent, good-looking guy like you reading the Bible? Uh, Actually, she didn't say smart and intelligent at, at all, but she said, why are you reading the Bible, basically? Because uh, what, what she was getting to was, was basically, why, why are you wasting your time? And see, I say that because if that's more like you, uh, where you've determined not to trust the Bible, then here's the reality, you probably won't, right? But my proposition in all of this is twofold. One is that the most important decision you can make in your life, uh, honestly, is accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but the second most important decision you can make in your entire life is, is believing and accepting the Bible as the word of God and letting it impact your life. And see, I get this idea actually from the Bible itself. Check out this very first verse here in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God. And see, here's what I'm not asking you to do today. I'm not asking you to check your brain at the door. I'm not asking you to do that. But I do want us to, to maybe, maybe look at some of the reasons and rationales why you can trust the Bible as an authority uh, in our world. And so I'm definitely going to be teaching way more than preaching today for sure. In fact, for some of you, this might become a little bit boring. I just, just letting you know right out front. Uh, but sometimes we do need to, need to learn. And so here's the first thing I want to throw out there. Number one is the reason why we can trust that scripture is authority and truth. Number one is internal evidence, internal evidence. See, the Bible claims for itself to be the inspired word of God. First Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3 says this, says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And see, not too many books actually claim that about itself. The challenge though is this, is because of that claim, you can't just call the Bible a good book. Can't do it. Why? Because either it's teaching truth or it's teaching falsehood. And yet when you read it, trust me, it just seems to make sense. J.B. Phillips, he wrote a book on the gospel of John, and in it he wrote, uh, honestly, the quote just says, it just makes, it just seems to make, make sense. In fact, think of these, think of these Bible statements. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to Wells Fargo. Actually, it says to the lender, that's what it says. Or the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? Just makes sense. Or this in Proverbs 27, 10 says, in your, in your time of need, it is better to go to a neighbor nearby than to a relative who lives far away, right? Again, makes sense. Why? Because your relatives are probably just going to be too cheap to help you out anyway, right? I mean, just be honest there. Ephesians 4, 15 says, speak the whole truth and tell it in love, or maybe this last one, Proverbs 21, says better to live on the corner of your room than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. See, again, this just makes sense, right? And see, because of that, there's a side note here of number two, incredible impact. See, no philosophy or no holy book has had so much influence uh, in people's thinking as the Bible. It's the best-selling book of all time. It's been translating into over 2,200 languages. In fact, George Washington himself, here's what he said. He says, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God in the Bible. Napoleon Bonaparte said this, says the Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. And the list, as you may have known, goes on and on and on. But there's also number three. And number three is really the crux of it, and it is the, the remarkable, remarkable accuracy. Uh, and, and so for some of you, this is where it, goes, it might get a little bit dry. For all you history buffs, this, might, this is where you're going to really tune in, you know. Uh, but a legitimate question out there is this, is, is can we trust the Bible that we have today actually reflects the original? And the answer is yes. 
where the evidence is overwhelming. Primarily in what's called manuscript evidence. Where basically, here's the crux of manuscript evidence. It's, it's the thought of, of, you know, it's looking at both the number of manuscript copies and the length of time between the copy and the original. Where the shorter the time, uh, the more accurate and more, more timely it's, it's thought to be. And so in dealing with, with just the New Testaments, the very first copies of the New Testament were written within 70 years from the original. Uh, which was, again, during the lifetime of the apostles. And the reason why that matters is because now you're talking about a story and you're talking about uh, God's word that was written um, during the time frame of the eyewitnesses that actually saw it happen. And so it's huge, right? As well as the fact when you look at manuscript copies, here, let me just throw a number out there to you. There's 5,300 and I believe 66 complete manuscript top copies of the New Testament. I'll put that in perspective. When, if you look at uh, ancient Greeks, uh, most famous writing, you know what it was? It's called the Iliad. Okay. Some of you read it in eighth grade, right? But it was called the Iliad. Well, the number of manuscript copies of the Iliad was 643, way less than the 5,366 of the New Testament. Or maybe you look at, at Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, right? Another huge, huge uh, piece of writing. You know how many manuscript copies there were? 10. There were 10. And they were actually copied basically a thousand years after the original. And no one, no one at all disputes its validity. And so the manuscript evidence is nearly 10 times greater than any other broadly accepted, accepted work. Or, you know, maybe you've heard, uh, hey, Rusty, but, but I've heard that there's disputed words in, in Scripture, like there's, there's words that are, that are incorrect or whatever. Yeah, you're right. There's 400 of them. There really are. Now, at the same time, though, none of those, none of those words change even the most minute of doctrines or the meaning of the paragraph. You can also look at in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, there was something that came up that was called textual criticism. Textual criticism was basically saying, hey, they were looking at the book of John. Uh, and when you look at the book of John, they were saying, this is, this is so accurate. This is so um, in tune with the philosophy of Christianity that it had to have been written hundreds of years after uh, Christ, uh, the death of Christ. It had to be, right? And this theory was widely accepted because it was just so clear on the Christian message. Well, it was widely accepted until they found a, a fragment of a copy of the book of John, and it was dated to 90 AD. Again, within the lifetime of the apostle John, right? And you can even go on even further where, where you know, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know if you've ever heard of those before, but, but basically the question out there again was, was does our current Bible actually reflect the original, Right? And, and it, was, it was a big question of, does it really? Uh, up until 1947, when they, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and they were able to see that, that the oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament that they found uh, were virtually identical to our current, uh, our current copies today, where, where it just proved that there was really nothing had changed, uh, and it was miraculous in, in, in how all of that worked out. Now, now part of that too was just the, the ma meticulousness of, of how they copied things. Like, like every single column had to be the same. Every row had to be the same. Every, the amount of words on a page had to be, I mean, it was, just, it was intense. Uh, but that's why everything also stayed so um, in such continuity. Where over, over thousands of years of copying, we can rest assured that it is, it is the real thing. There's also number four, write this down. It's a surprising continuity. Folks, the Bible was actually written over a span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors on, on three different continents. And yet it has this uncanny and supernatural continuity to its theme and story. Where the Bible's consistent message is this, God loves us and he worked out a plan, right? He took action to rescue us. And see, to bring it back to, back to us, right, this unity of message is really why we preach the way we do. Where, where there's sometimes that I'll take just a, a book of the Bible like we did in our last um, sermon series. But more times than not, 
we'll look at the entire totality of scripture uh, to, to, to figure out God's word on a subject, right? We'll take the entire counsel of God's word to, to learn how to deal with a certain subject. And partially the reason why we do that, actually primarily the reason why we do this is because Peter, Paul, and Jesus uh, all spoke that way. They took the totality of scripture in order to, in order to speak on a subject. Here's the fifth thing, number five, write this down, reliable history. And see, here's the reality. Some of you might still be sitting there and saying, you know what, I'm just not sure. I still, I believe in the Bible. And see, if that's the truth, hey, here's the deal. Uh, You're in good company. You you really are. In fact, from an archaeological perspective, uh, Sir William Ramsey tried to disprove uh, the accuracy or the validity of the Bible. And yet, while trying to disprove it, here's what he said. He said, that which I was intent on disbelieving, I now see is true. Or even from a legal perspective, Lee Strobel, maybe you've heard of him. He was the legal editor-in-chief for the Chicago Tribune, uh, and now actually the author for A Case for Faith and A Case for Christ, went off for a year to try to prove that his wife had gone insane because she started believing in the Bible. So he said, no, no, I'm going to prove that you're insane. I'm sure that was a very you know, loving and, and affectionate household during that time. Uh, but during that year, uh, he, he became a Christian. And he decided, no, no, this is, this is true. And see, even if you, if, if you take those things away and you look at more of a historical perspective, one of the things that you can look at uh, historically within Scripture is all the prophecies. You'll see that there were hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that, that, had, that had come to fruition uh, when, when, when thrown out there. In fact, I'll give you just one. If you look at Ezekiel chapter 26, you'll see uh, where, the, where the city of Tyre was supposed to be de- uh, destroyed right? Uh, by the way, the city of Tyre way back when, uh, you, know, you know who the ruler was? His name was Goodyear, uh, which seems to be a pro- pro- prophecy to me, uh, just, <laughs> just valid right then and there. Uh, but just like the Bible predicted and prophesied about, the city of Tyre uh, was destroyed and the Phoenician Tyre was never built again. So, so it, it, it all came to fruition. And so there's all sorts of historical evidence on all of this. See, I'm going to bring it back to one, one topic, though, our, our sixth thing I want you, to, want you to write down. And really, for the sake of time, I can't, I can't, I can't delve into every one of these areas because you could write volumes on each one of these things that I've stated. But here's the last one. It's Jesus himself. It's Jesus. And see, over the years, I've had so many people come up to me and say, Rusty, well, I, I, I buy into Jesus, but I just, I just don't buy into the Bible. Well, the problem with that is, is that Jesus himself, while he was here on earth, spoke directly from the Old Testament. In fact, he quoted 22 different books in the Old Testament as being the very words of God. In fact, in fact if you look at Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered and he said this, it is written, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And see, what's interesting is that even some of the characters that, that are most disputed in the Bible as fictional or, or, or whatever, uh, Jesus actually affirms to be completely true. People like Adam and Eve, right? Noah, Jonah, uh, all of these people. Jesus actually says, no, 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 these are real people. And so for us to, to say, you know what, I, I believe I buy into Jesus, but not scripture. You know, here, here's the thing. It would be inconsistent for us to be able to say that, uh, that I believe in Jesus, but not, not the credibility of, of scripture. John 17, 17 Jesus said it very, very succinctly as he was praying to the Father. He said, your word is truth. And see, when we go through life, we absolutely need objective truth, right? Like when I go to file my taxes, I can't just go up to the dude and be like, yeah, you know what, Mr. IRS guy, I'm just going to give you what I feel is right in my heart. (laughs) Nah, I'll be uh, hanging out in a jail cell for (laughs) for a few years, right? It just doesn't happen. What we need is objective, not subjective truth. Well, the question for all of us is where we're going to find it, right? Your level of truth is only as good as your source of truth. And so where are we going to, where are we going to find it? And so let me, let me just take the last few minutes that we have together and just kind of personalize this as we move to, to application. Why does, a, why does a Bible matter to me? Here's the first one. Write this down. It gives me reliable spiritual information. See, the difference between Christianity and other faiths is, is that other, 
other, is that in other faiths, it's all about your search for God, right? Christianity is exactly the opposite. It's actually God's search for us to tell us how much he loves us and what he's, what he's, what he's done for us, right? Or again, God doesn't distance himself from us or play mind games with us to keep us guessing about who he is and all of that. Uh, and quite frankly, I'm thankful for that because I need better than a guess. I do, right? And so his word helps us to get to know him. Number two is the Bible tells me what God is like. Folks, if you want to know what God is like, read the Bible. And by the way, I don't care if you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, it doesn't matter to me. You're going to get the heart of God, right? Right? where I know there's a lot of people that come up to me and said, well, Russ, isn't the Old Testament about like the angry, smitey God, right? No, here's the truth is that you will absolutely read it. You will absolutely find a gracious, merciful, and loving God in both. Read it. You will, you cannot miss his heart, right? It's almost like, it's almost like when you, when you stalk people on Facebook, which I know every single one of you do. So don't, don't try to lie. You're still in church, even though you're at home. Okay. (laughs) Uh, but you can learn a lot about people if you look for it, right? That like on Facebook, people will tell you everything. You know, they'll, they'll tell you, they'll tell you what they think. They'll tell you what they ate. They tell who, who maybe who they voted for, who their friends are, how they're feeling, how their dog's feeling. Like they'll tell you everything, right? And see, in God's Facebook, he tells us enough about himself so we can make a decision to accept him where we get to know him so that we'll actually follow him. We read this in Proverbs, every word of God is flawless. And see, I know that that's another truth claim that's based inside of the Bible. But actually the most powerful part of that verse is the second part where it says this, he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Which means we get number three, insight beyond conventional wisdom. See, the Bible gives us a a reliable roadmap for life. In fact, in fact, I'd go so far as to say this, uh, the Bible's useless unless you use it. Really, that, I, I'd say the Bible's useless unless you actually apply it to your life. I mean, anybody watching this ever made a bad decision? Uh, are they sitting with you right now? I, I have no idea, right? But see, of course, we've all made some bad, bad decisions. There, there's no shame in that. But to keep making the same decision and expecting different results, well, Albert Einstein calls that the definition of insanity, Right? Psalm 119, 115 says, your lamp, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. And so if you're wanting to to learn more about who God is, here's here's what I encourage you to do. One, get a Bible, okay? If you don't have one, get one. And I'd suggest maybe you get an NIV or or even an NLT. It's it's helpful for me just to let you know. Uh, then, then, Then Figure out the the who, the when, the why. Read, right? Read the who, the when, the why, all of that. Start in the book of John or Luke, uh, depending on your personality. Luke is a lot more, you know, systematic. John uh, tells a lot more story, that kind of a thing. Then then set a goal. Once you've done that, then set a goal, right? A a chapter a day keeps the pastor away, okay? Just just letting you know. Uh, And then jump on a growth group. Those are the things that I'd encourage you to do. And we have growth groups online right now. I encourage you, if this is, you're just starting this out, jump into Alpha. Uh, You'll be able to ask a lot of those kind of questions um, and, 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 and have some great people around you. That's, that's my, my thought on that. And then here's number four. It shows me how to deal with my stuff. Folks, I need, I need this book. I, I absolutely do. Because I need to be reminded I, that I shouldn't covet other people's stuff, right? I need to be reminded by Jesus that, that I need to stop judging others or I need to forgive those who've wronged me, right? I need to be reminded that just like every single one of us do. Here's what it says in Psalm 107. It says, he sent forth his word and healed them. You see, the question for all of us, honestly, is there an area where you'd be open to God's healing today? And if there is, then here's the last thing I want you to write down. Number five, then you'll find that this book actually gives real hope for your future. That it gives real hope for your future. We're told in Joshua 1 it says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do me a favor, underline prosperous and successful. One of the ways that we demonstrate that we believe in the hope that God has for us is not only by getting to know God through the Bible, 
but actually doing what it instructs us to do. Remember, it says careful to do everything written, written in it. I've been praying for, for our entire church all week long that, that we would not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. Or maybe you're, maybe you're new to all this. Maybe you're just coming back to all of this. Here's what I want you to know. God absolutely has a plan and a desire for your life. He also has written about it in his word that you can see for yourself what he desires for you. And so my encouragement is to dive in. Get to know the God of the universe because his words are right there. And the words of healing, of love, and of grace for what you're going through. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you do line things out in your word. I thank you, God, that it's proven through history. I thank you, God, that it's, that it's accurate and that it's true. But, God, that it also just makes sense. Lord, that I can look at that and I can, I can live my life to a much greater level, to a blessed level, just, just, be, just by following what you say. And so, Father, I pray for every single person watching this. I pray, God, that we would have an increased desire to get to know you, that we would seek you, and when we seek you, we would find you when, you, when we seek you with all of our heart, that you can transform our life. God, that you can heal those areas that are broken. God, that you, can, that you can give us grace where we need it so we can be transformed. Father, I thank you that you have been cared enough to give us your word. Lord, be with us. Help us to get through. Give us the, the stamina and the courage to take another step during these trying times. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.